In a unit on solids and liquids, I like to begin a concept with a story. And what I do is I read to my students this first sentence from a story, and I don't tell them what it's from. And the story goes like this. Day had broken, cold and gray, exceedingly cold and gray, when the man turned aside from the main Yukon Trail and climbed the high earth bank where a dim and little traveled trail led eastward through the fat spruce timberland. Now, with my students, I would say, do you recognize this introduction or the very first sentence of a story? Have you read this before in your classes? And I would have to say that almost 100% of my students have read this story. And I'll say, well, what is that story? And this is a good opportunity to give them some bonus points for knowing something from another discipline. And they'll say, well, that's uh, to build a fire. And I'll say, OK, does anyone know the author? Well, it's Jack London. And I'll say, well, what was going on with Jack London? character there. What was this man doing? And then they will say, well, uh, he was out there. Uh, and it was the time of the Klondike Gold Rush. And I'll say, oh, do you know when that was? And it was 1897 that it started. And I'll say, was he out there by himself? Well, no, he was out there with a dog. And of course, in the story, he's trying to build a fire to keep warm. And so we'll talk a little bit about Jack London, because it turns out that in Oakland, California, which is my hometown, and I share this with my students, that there is Jack London Square. And there's some shack where apparently Jack would go hoist a few in the days when he was between writings. And so we'll talk about this, this Klondike Gold Rush. And I'll talk about the city that really blossomed as a result of this. And that, of course, in the United States is Seattle. And if you go to Seattle, there's a Klondike Gold Rush Museum. And so you can bring in a few aspects of geography there as well. Now, once we've kind of milked that for all it's worth, but I will add, did the character survive? And I think that's the really sad part, because when I read this in high school, I found that really demoralizing, that not only does he not survive, but I found out that if you're going to freeze to death, you don't just go to sleep and die. You're going to know about it. You're going to wake up and know that you're cold. So I thought that was kind of an unfortunate thing. And if anyone's ever been backpacking, back when you used air mattresses and have your air mattress go out on you and you wake up in the middle of the night cold, not a pleasant situation. So after we've looked at this story, I'll tell them we're going to talk about another short story that's called To Distill Some Water. And by the way, this story is on the NASA website, and it's actually concocted by someone affiliated with NASA. But notice the similarity. And this story was written at the time that uh, one of the uh, Martian explorations was going on, and they landed the rover on Mars. And in fact, if maybe your students might know about it, but it goes back to about 2004. So day had broken, cold and reddish, exceedingly cold and reddish, from dust suspended in Mars' thin atmosphere when the explorer climbed the inner crater wall. So with my students, I would read this entire story. But before I would finish the story, I would do the demonstration. So let's go over here to the demonstration table. And let's look at our setup. What we have here is a thick walled flask. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to wear your safety glasses for this, as I would have with my students, because we're going to be dealing with some pressure issues. Now, what I started out with was uh, about 150 milliliters or thereabouts of water. And the idea is to heat this up until about half of that water is gone. Now, what's happening here is that water heats. Well, it's being converted into water vapor, that is H2OG. And uh, there was air in the flask, of course, before then. But the air gets pushed out of the flask as we form the water vapor. So if we heat this for a considerable length of time, eventually we're going to get to a point where the flask only contains steam and water, that there will not be any molecules of nitrogen and oxygen, the main constituents of air in there. So after I've heated it for this extended time to boil a lot of water and fill the flask with steam and drive out the air, I then discontinue heating, and uh, I'm going to pull out the hot plate here. 
and I'm going to wait for the boiling to stop, and then I'm going to stopper it, but on the side arm here, I'm also going to use a screw clamp to seal this off. It's really important that this be tight. And I've got some uh, very flexible tubing here. Makes it easy to make that tight seal. Now we notice that the water has ceased boiling. I'm sure the stopper's on well. And now I'm going to flip the flask. Okay, now let's talk about what's in the flask. We've got water here, and we've got water vapor up here. And um, what I'm going to do is cool this down. Now, it helps to keep it from getting too messy to put a glass Petri dish on the top. And you actually see some bubbles already forming in there. And uh, the thing is, well, is it leaking? Is there air going in? But no, there's no water dripping out. But let's cool down that water vapor up there, and what's going to happen? It's going to condense, right? So let's pile in some ice up here to cool that down pretty rapidly. And what you can do also is you can uh, maybe put some ice on the sides of the flask here to cool it down as well as on top. And what do you see happening? You see some pretty rapid boiling, don't you? Now again, you do see some dripping here, but that's the dripping from the ice. That's not the dripping from water coming out of there. It's not air going in there. What we are doing here is causing the water to boil at a much lower temperature. Now why does it do that? Because the boiling point depends on the atmospheric pressure. And that's what we would be stressing here, that the lower the pressure, the lower the boiling point. And in fact, we all know that when you go to the Mile High City of Denver, that there are different directions for baking cakes. They sell different tennis balls for, that high, for the reduced pressure at the high altitude. And what you can do here is you can just really chill this down and get it you know, much, much cooler. Now, I'm not going to measure the temperature right now on this, but you could do that. But what I am going to do is open the flask because as we condense that water vapor, we know that there's a much lower pressure inside the flask than outside the flask. So let's uh, flip this again. And at this point, even though it's a little bit warm, it's still not so hot that I can't even touch it. And I'm going to move it down on the ring stand here, so that way I don't have to worry about it wobbling. And you can have a student maybe come up, and so we're going to get really quiet and hear the difference when I pull this off. Okay, we get a little bit of a whoosh there because of that difference in pressure. And so what you have demonstrated is how the atmospheric pressure impacts boiling point. And so that's why we have normal boiling point, which is the boiling point at which something boils when the atmospheric pressure is at standard pressure, which would be one atmosphere or 760 millimeters of mercury. So pressure affects boiling point. Now, I did this demonstration in the last couple of years. It just coincidentally coincidentally, fell during Read Across America Week. And I'm a big proponent of reading to my students. And believe it or not, even high school students enjoy being read to. And so I would go back and finish the story. That's to distill some water. But I'm not going to finish the entire story for you. What I'm going to do is just read you some excerpts from this. We've already looked at the introductory sentence here. 
He unlocked the oven's external door, retrieved the cup, and moved to drain it into his suit's water bottle, but not fast enough. The water began fizzing and steaming angrily, leaping over the rim and then freezing in a tiny cloud of ice crystals. In moments, the cup was completely dried. He struggled for calm. Liquid water was highly unstable in Mars' vacuum-like atmosphere. He knew that, but he didn't realize how rapid it would boil. So what's happening in our story to distill some water is that the vacuum-like atmosphere of Mars caused the water to just boil instantly at that uh, reduced pressure. Now, in the story, I will tell you that it does have a happy ending, that the person who is, uh, who is uh, exploring Mars uh, actually does survive because someone comes to rescue him even though he runs out of water. And it's an interesting storyline, and it fits very nicely into this demonstration. And like I said, reading to students is something that they really can enjoy. And whether or not you can work this into the Read Across America Week, which is uh, Dr. Seuss's birthday in March, I do recommend that you celebrate Dr. Seuss's birthday in Read Across America, not necessarily with this demonstration, but what I do with my students is I tell them that I want them to go home and to read to someone. And I tell them that that someone has to be someone much younger, like a brother or sister, or it could be someone much older, like a, a grandparent. And I said, I want them to go home, I want them to read to someone, and then I want them to come back to class, and they get bonus points, and they report to the class to whom they read and what they read. So this is kind of a nice jumping off point to stress that reading is really important in our lives.